Welcome back. Today I'd like to tell you all a little story. A little tale of my experience at the first ever Root Convention. You'll have to pardon the simplistic animations as I hadn't planned on making a video for this. Welcome to RootCon, a two-day extravaganza of all things Root, organized by Good Time Society and Woodland War Machine, and officially sponsored by Leader Games. So gather round my fire.png, and I'll regale you with my long-winded tale. Our story begins around mid-June 2023. I had my tickets bought pretty much the day they went live back in March, but I'd been too busy otherwise to think about the convention too much. This was the first convention I'd be attending where I could have been misconstrued as a special guest. And in the immortal words of Oscar Wilde, nah, fuck that shit. Instead, I resolved to attend in the manner most befitting my own particular idiom. I'll pretend that I'm not going, and see how many people manage to figure it out in person. We're going to call it the Nebuchadnezzar ARG, as if I had actually put effort into it. Preparation time was running out, however, and I had been camping the RootCon thread, looking for someone to split a room like a single woman in her 30s camps her Tinder inbox. Suddenly, there it is. SP Shaman is attending RootCon. I slide into his DMs. I have just barely enough time to assemble a new faction guide in time for RootCon, and after confirming with Murder She Root, I announce to the world that my Riverfolk guide will be releasing as a live premiere during the convention. Then, the Day of Prophecy arrives. My flight is timely, and I meet up with SP at the airport. We brave the Portland transit system to drop off our bags at the hotel. We're both starving, so we resolve to check out one of the food truck pavilions for some lunch. Options are plentiful. Asian fusion? Mexican experimental? Mexperimental? Ska? Asian fusion again? I'm not really in a mood to overthink it. Good old shawarma. You're the same no matter where I go. The Lady Galadriel of foodstuffs, everybody loves you and despairs. This is foreshadowing for later. Following lunch, we'll meet up with some other attendees at a local pub. I know exactly who's who because we're attending a root convention and these people are already playing Nemesis. Despite introducing myself by my first name only, a couple people managed to suss out my identity almost immediately. Shaman throws off a sweet looking card game he's been working on, and while playing Root, I work my way through about 4 points of 7% oatmeal stout in lieu of actually eating dinner. After returning to the hotel, my evening ends with me making several desperate calls on the porcelain phone. Here's a fun and relevant fact about me, however. My pale Canadian constitution may be ill-prepared for the 30 degree temperatures of a Portland summer, but it has graced me with a pretty good tolerance for alcohol. In so many words, I don't get hungover. Feel free to express your jealousy in the comments below. So when I awoke the next morning with my stomach too upset to actually eat, it was... odd. Perhaps I'd underestimated those oatmeal stouts, I thought to myself, as I choked down three bites of my chewy waffle. The feeling was suppressed somewhat as we arrived for the first day of the convention, and got checked in for our first games of the tournament. Murder Shri Root recognizes my name immediately and grins as he welcomes us to RootCon. I'm the last to arrive at my table, introduce myself by my first name again, and we start the draft. We have the Despot, Harrier, Otters, and myself on Lizards. I have a solid Lizard hand, and outside of the Harrier, this draft is not very aggressive. Then, two things happen in very short order. Firstly, I set up two garden suits and draw most of the ambushes and dominance cards, and secondly, I start absolutely sweating bullets in spite of the air conditioning and the adjacent fan. I excuse myself momentarily to the bathroom, explaining that I'm not feeling very well. Once there, desperately trying to cool down, I start to take stock of my situation. There is a river of sweat coming off of me. I feel dizzy and nauseous. My entire upper body is tingling. Cooling myself down is somewhat helpful. This wouldn't be the first time, so it seems possible I might have heatstroke. I return to the table, dry paper towels in hand to ward off my continued perspiration. My turn is up, and the otter player's young son once again turns their open hand to me and chirps, Wanna buy something? He's done this every round, and I find it endearing. I have no idea how many rounds it's been, however. This could be turn 2 or turn 200, and I would have been completely unable to tell. Trying not to seem rude, I grab a helpful card and force a smile as the walls around me waver constantly in and out of focus. 
I take a large swig of water, thinking it should help my condition. I am gravely mistaken. In mere minutes, the bathroom summons me once again, this time with dire immediacy. Guardian Games only has two bathrooms, however, and with over 120 attendees, a brief line is ever-present. I try my best to resist, but I don't have that kind of time. The front door is my only hope, and seeing the bright light wavering at me from across the building brings to mind the image of a drowning man swimming towards the surface. An employee near the door bids me farewell as I pass, and all I can think to say is, I'll be right back, I'm gonna be sick. I find myself crouched in a small gravel median beside two dumpsters and a small pool of my own vomit. What an auspicious start to the convention, I think, as the hot sun warms me in my black t-shirt. Warms. Warms, as in, I was not already that warm. Something isn't adding up. If this were heat stroke, this sun would be agony right now. My stomach couldn't even handle water. If this isn't heat stroke, then... Yes, of course. Dodgy food truck shawarma. I have food poisoning. I return to my table, inform Murdashree Root of my new hypothesis. We resolve that should I be sick again, it would be best to drop out of my game. I look over the board as I take my seat. My gardens are decently defended, and I have a strong hand with some ambushes. Not even the Harrier is well equipped to fight me. Most important of all, I'm about six points ahead of the table. Realization dawns. I have rarely ever been this ill. But I can also win the game. I figure I can't throw up in an empty stomach, so we're going to tough this out without water. The fever and tingling mercifully disappear, replaced by full-body chills and shivering. A perfect improvement, I think, since I'm used to the cold. My vision continues wobbling, and as I apologize for having to roll back some minutia of my turn, one of my opponents applauds me for having the presence of mind to still be dom-swapping cards during my turn in the first place. I am at 24 points now, and the otters have removed two of my gardens. The harrier has removed another, but lacks the boots they need to remove more. Ironic, I croak, trying to channel my inner sheath Palpatine. He is the most mobile vagabond, but mobility was what he needed. I have no idea if intelligible words ever actually left my mouth. Between coffin makers and ten acolytes, however, even my fevered mind was able to secure victory. The real prize is that I had no further games I had to play that day, so I could focus on trying to recover. I ask if the venue has anywhere I can lie down. It does not. The rest of my afternoon is spent wandering the other tables, marveling at Round 1's only five-player game, which has no less than six meeples in every clearing and no end in sight. I watch as a rat player overlooks his one chance to deal maximum damage against Lily G's moles by employing the looter's ability. You may have missed it, but now everyone knows it happened. I'm introduced to Jake and Kyle from the podcast. They're all delightful, and I don't think any of them ever sat down once unless they were scheduled to do so. Murder She Root has a copy of the bootleg Chinese Root game that he's planning to get Cole Worley to sign. Seeing this thing is truly an experience. You might be fooled into thinking that it compares favorably to the original McCoy, with its bold characters and saturated colors, but this difference runs skin deep, and I think I've cracked the code. The character art is custom, I'm pretty sure. The box art and card art are all consistent, and they do their best to rip off the original art everywhere they can. Everything else, from the icons for factions and pieces to the trees and buildings printed on the map, is taken from free online game art repositories. They'll use three separate icons for the same game piece because it appeared in three different places in the rulebook. None of the art on the maps is consistent. There will be trees shaded differently from houses. And worst of all, the most terrible thing of all, those ugly little butt plug meeples are not actually flat on the bottom. They wobble. Garrick, Lord of the Board, Josh Yearsley, and Cole Worley are playing the latest cut of arcs in the middle of the room. The space theme is appropriate because their combined star power in this modest gathering is creating its own gravitational field. I test their powers of voice recognition by asking Lord of the Board where he got his Corvid pin. From the leader's door, apparently. 
Garrett claims he recognized me after only a couple seconds, but I believe he probably would have made that claim either way. Later, with another group, I'm shown how to play Takanoko, which I lose horrendously. I'm supposed to manipulate a panda in order to achieve various scoring goals which are on cards I have to draw which competes for the same actions I need for the panda. This must be what it feels like to operate a real-life panda breeding program. The ape-like confusion expressed by the man in the box mirrors my current mental state perfectly. Hours must have passed with me in this state because the five-player game has now somehow concluded, with a corvid victory. I am eager to congratulate this win, and I watch the spark of recognition alight upon the excited victor's face. Wait, you sound a lot like Nevakaneza. Are you Nevakaneza? Never heard of him. In the long, pregnant pause that follows, we are both acutely aware that this is the exact response one should expect from Nevakaneza. My facade begins to waver, and a shit-eating grin creeps across my face. Unable to come up with a better response in time, I robotically turn back to my table, leaving her answerless. I would tell her the truth later. Apparently she was quite worried she had embarrassed herself in front of an actual, real person. Sorry again for that, I didn't mean to make you uncomfortable. Someone then walks in with a pretty good looking poke bowl from another food truck, and the return of my appetite informs me of two things. First, I'm starting to recover from that shawarma. Second, that it has been over 24 hours since I had that accursed tube, and all I've eaten was three bites of a waffle. I'm released from Panda Purgatory and pay this food truck a visit. I spend the next hour eating my poke bowl. It's probably delicious. Then, I manage to cajole Garrick into a casual five-player game of Root, officially inducting him into the Nevakaneza ARG. Appropriately, we immediately encounter a rules issue with Badger's setup, but we have the advantage of being able to escalate it to Josh Earsley himself. I think I brought Josh in on the secret, but I kind of half-assed it, so I can't be sure. Our game goes well, however, but Garrett gets bullied relentlessly, mostly because he remains a threat even with nothing on the board. I end up losing to... Warlord, I think? The fatigue of my recovery was setting in. I'm a bit too drained for another root game, and I start canvassing people for a game of Calico. I check the rental shelf three times, yet I still need Murder She Root's help to find it for me. Auspicious. I manage to get the game together, and we barely manage to complete our boards just as the store is closing for the night. Good timing, because I really need the sleep. Round two of the winner's bracket is scheduled to begin at the crisp hour of 10.30 a.m. Truly, I am suffering from success. My stomach has mostly settled, and I enjoy the free hotel breakfast of waffles and sausage that is, above all other qualities, free. Arriving at the venue, I learn that each of the games this round will have five players, which is a welcome and egalitarian change of pace. In considering my Nevakaneza ARG, I knew that this joke was never going to last very long for a gathering of this size, and I resolved to actually wear my lanyard today to let the surprise play out on its own. I am quickly reminded that I hate wearing lanyards, and back in my pocket it goes. Taking my seat, I'm introduced to three players for the first time, and one player I know fairly well. Waterman is flitting between tables to take commemorative photos as I deal out the draft. Moles of the initial red faction. Cursed draft. Crows show up midway. Blessed draft. Our game drafts to first seat moles, then woodland alliance, myself as crows, my familiar player as cats, and thief vagabond in last seat. Lizards go unchosen. I hadn't fully considered it at the time, but this draft is fantastic for me. I am in a position to eat free woodland alliance cardboard and bully moles and cats to keep them in check and buy myself space. Vagabond is mainly the cat's player's problem, and I have extra leeway in how much I'll be able to control the player I know will be as sweaty as myself. It's even on the winter map. My favorite. With that, the game is on. Moles take a very effective first turn by swaying Brigadier, recruiting twice, and revealing a hand that already matches the clearings they're in. In a way, I'm relieved. Moles have a wide gap between skill floor and skill ceiling, and an opening this clean and confident clearly establishes that this player knows them well. The alliance sets up on the mole side, next to my starting plot. Cats follow their typical build-out, 
spacing their buildings as much as possible, and then using some bird cards to consolidate control over their half of the board, establish martial law, and recruit. The Vagabond's early turns are similarly plain. As the game progresses, the moles continue to play a very effective, small game plan, and their scoring pace reflects this. The Alliance player actually builds out unusually slowly, which they later admit was the result of an early misjudgment on their part. Cats break from tradition with some early workshops and make good use of it to craft additional items to maintain pace and deny these points to others. They also find some time to harry the Vagabond, a sure sign that they're not yet pressured enough for me to plot on their side of the map safely. Our Vagabond player finds himself starved for bag space, and I'm more than happy to oblige by crafting it. My early turns revolve around stymieing moles every turn I can while plotting in the ample space unclaimed by either them or the Alliance. I've gotten good value out of my plots so far, and the table scores are quite close as we approach 15 victory points. On a hunch, I throw two bombs in the southern choke point, one of which I leave completely undefended. Go ahead, nerds. Ignore my raid. The cat player knows I'm becoming a threat, however. After a failed guess on one of my raids, he deliberately hands me coffin makers, informing the entire table that I now have it, as well as the sabo that I had crafted earlier. Since all four bunny clearings are next to each other on my side, his plan is to coax the table into destroying me under the guise of preventing me from crafting coffin makers. His plan is solid, but his soldiers are weak. Moles can only commit to battling with the two warriors they already had present in my clearing, and a 1-1 rule leaves the plot unflippable but untouched. Alliance has a more ambitious plan, and they ride several warriors south from their corner to take out my actual face-up raid to at least slow my scoring. This has the side effect of re-enabling my face-down raid, which is, of course, a bomb. As my turn comes around again, I happily craft the coffin makers and flip my bomb while I still have the chance. Net losses? One cat the first inductee to my new coffins. As the mid-game arrives, the duchy's efforts to eat cardboard reveal the impact of their losses thus far, as they're becoming rather thin on the board. The unfortunate alliance player continues to struggle to escape their self-imposed exile below the 10 victory point line. I was sorely tempted to release them to go dwell in cat territory forever, but it just wasn't worth losing the propaganda bureau, swap meet, partisans, and charm offensive that I have already crafted for myself. Cats have been pulling ahead of the table, however, and have amassed nearly all of their warriors onto the top and west sides of the map. Their three-way conflict with the Moles and Vagabond in the southern choke point has left soft spots in their backline, however. Taking out one of their three sawmills would make me their immediate hated enemy, but a northern workshop and recruiter make for mutually agreeable losses while the cat's attention is elsewhere. At this point, the Vagabond has amassed a genuinely uncomfortable number of items. Only two swords but 10 items overall at least, with two mouse quests already complete. This is entirely the fault of myself and the Cats player, and we agree that the Vagabond is overdue for a trip to the forest. Cats reluctantly craft a second tea, bemoaning the fact they'll likely regret that choice later. My turn arrives, and I explain, You know, Vagabond, you really are a major problem that needs to be dealt with this turn. But even more important than that, you're someone else's problem which is why I'm going to be crafting this hammer. The Cats player groans audibly. My plan works. Cats simply don't have the actions to keep up with the table while battling both myself and the Vagabond, so by offering to place low-harm plots on non-essential cat clearings, I make myself a target the cats can pawn off onto the moles. The end game arrives, and Coffin Makers has kept my scoring actually competitive where plots would not have sufficed. I find myself at a nerve-wracking 22 points, with four plots on the board. I've been swap-meeting the moles every turn instead of fighting them, and they're now aware that I could craft a sword to comfortably tip me over 30 points. The cats managed to end their turn at 26, and they've poured virtually their entire last turn into trying to stop the Vagabond, but their satchel still has 10 items to work with. In spite of this, barring miraculous luck from a table-wide effort, the cats are certain to win on their next turn. The Vagabond's turn begins. Ever the force of balance, they continue to spread their violence across each of us quite equally. A slip from mouse to rabbit. I begin to evaluate their potential. Still only two swords, but a plethora of other items available. A mole is struck down. Then they complete their first rabbit quest, 24 victory points. And my blood runs cold. The mouse quests. They have the boots they need to return to Mouse for that three victory point quest, and once there, 
ample warriors are available for the last two points. He pulls the quest and tips it forward for all of us to see. As I glimpse that telltale orange banner reflected in the glare of the store's fluorescent lighting, my heart sinks. There it is. A Vagabond win. And then, he starts tipping the card back. The glare of the artificial lights slides away from the quest's suit banner, and I can barely believe my eyes when the banner shifts from bright orange to dark red. It wasn't a mouse quest at all. Three fox quests, each one entirely beyond the Vagabond's reach, silently wink to me from above the Vagabond's faction board. The remainder of the Vagabond's turn is spent destroying my extortion plot and its two defenders to control my scoring, but my relief is so enormous after that ordeal that I could not possibly care. The Vagabond ends their turn at 28. Only two turns remain ahead of mine. The Alliance, whose base hosts one of my plots, and the Moles. I have been deep in conversations with the Moles at this point. If there's any hope at all of blocking a cat win, it's going to require me committing my utmost effort and also having luck on my side in order to achieve. I know that it falls upon the moles to police me, and they know I have the sword. I want to compromise. I need to be able to make some forward progress on my turn via plots, or else there simply isn't a point in taking my turn, as I would reach 25 points at most while someone else took the win. This banter has been back and forth, as I'm arguing opposite the cats, who insist that the three victory points from my two face-down plots is still a considerable threat. The moles agree to focus their attack on my face-up raid, and my relief is tempered by having to recalculate whether I still could find a win from these remaining flips. As they sway, fight cats, and make their way back to their tunnel, I rack my brain looking over the highly defended cat cardboard and guessing wildly at where sympathy might spread. Then it happens. Almost apologetically, the moles express that they still can't trust my face-down plot, and offer a card for exposure. While my heart has sank during the Vagabond's quest pull, being forced to remove my only hope of victory with the other plot no doubt soon to follow left me heartbroken. Not because I had missed a tournament win, nor because it had been this close, and certainly not for any grudge I held against the mole player, whose judgement was sound. No, it was because in typical Corvid fashion, all of the effort, planning, and preparation I have invested in this game so far was dismissed as an afterthought, an addendum at the tail end of someone's turn. As the moles ended their turn and asked what I had in mind for stopping the cats, all I could think to reply was that I would likely skip my turn, as nothing I could do on my turn would have any impact in either direction. This kind of defeatist admission was not my proudest moment, but in that moment, it felt honest. Fighting to regain my composure, I am vaguely aware of the Alliance player's turn as they revel in their chance to finally reach across the map. I find it within me to be grateful that they didn't remove my plot on their base, sparing me at least this last final humiliation. I'm growing ashamed of my prior stated intent to pass my turn in forfeit, and I take a deep breath and reevaluate the impact I can actually make on this board. The others, still tense in anticipation of a possible Corvid win that isn't coming, ask whether I have it on my turn. Not after that plot guess, I'm afraid I tell them. With two plots, I still had to get kind of lucky, but as it is, no matter how I slice it, the cardboard just isn't there. The Cats player leans over to look at me and gestures towards the board. Even with Coffin Makers? My heart skips a beat. Despite placing it in the center of the map for easy access, I had completely forgotten this card's existence. The Cat player continues. It's worth two points already right now. An iota of life returns to my crumpled, sodden form. For you see, the reality is that those two face-down plots were twins. Twin bombs. Either plot could have flipped for three points, but 28 victory points from Sympathy does not a win make. The last time I had even considered Coffin Makers was at the end of my previous turn. 22 points. Two from Coffins, three from the Bomb, for 27 at the start of my turn. It was absolutely possible. 
I've even got warriors already stacked on three sympathetic mouse clearings. I walk through my birdsong, then turn to the Woodland Alliance player. All right, whether I win or not depends entirely on if you have a mouse ambush in your hand. He smiles and raises his hands. No ambush. My first Corvid victory in any tournament I've attended. The fact that I'm now a finalist can't even lay a finger on the elation I'm feeling for winning a Crows game. I congratulate each of my opponents, apologize for falling victim to defeatism, and begin trying to ground myself after that emotional roller coaster. The hour is currently half past one, and I don't want to waste time as I have an important appointment to make. I consider getting food, but the food trucks end up taking too long for the people in front of me, and I skip lunch entirely. You see, at 2pm, my Riverfolk guide is going to premiere, and I wouldn't miss these reactions for the world. For the uninitiated among you, the video I had worked so hard to complete for RootCon, that I had teased on two separate occasions with jaunty corporate otters, is not actually a Riverfolk guide. It was my Corvid conspiracy guide. The reveal comes midway through the intro, but I won't spoil any more here. This was the most thematic delivery I could think of for the Crows, and I was willing to risk the community guidelines strike in order to present it the way I wanted. I have since updated the thumbnail and description, so you're too late to catch me now, YouTube. I brought modest expectations for what live viewership at RuCon was going to look like, and this was prescient. Most people ended up being busy with their own games, and appropriately unavailable to sit down for an hour-long movie. It did get over 60 people watching at its peak, and the reactions were fantastic, so I couldn't be happier. I watch until the reactions subside, but I can't stick around for the whole thing, as running out of cell phone battery as a foreigner would be bad. I have some time before I need to appear for the finals game, so I take this chance to make sure I get some of the signatures I wanted. The list of signatures I want can be summarized as anyone I recognize from the Discord or Leader Games, as well as any cool people I met or played at the convention. Where several people brought rule books or their Exiles and Partisan decks for signatures, I chose to bring the lid from my copy for the root base game. The choice to bring my own paint markers was wise, but it turns out that gold paint blends into the box art quite well. I don't dislike it, though. With 15 minutes to go before the beginning of finals, I'm strong-armed into a game titled We're Doomed. The premise is that your political factions fighting for the remaining seats on the only ship leaving a dying Earth. No, no, they tell me, as I mention the time constraint. There's literally a 15-minute hourglass that governs the game. This hourglass does indeed exist. The game is easy to learn, and I'm the third and final member of our five-person party to board the ship. Everyone wins! Finals time has arrived. I'm led upstairs to a dark floor of the building containing an office, a couple cubicles, a bunch of storage shelves, and an area in the middle that's been cleared out to act as our recording studio. Three of the cameras present will be for the final YouTube video, they tell us. The final camera is a cell phone that is streaming to the TV downstairs. After going over the finer points of what not to do in front of these cameras, I have only one question. Do I need to watch my language at all? No, we'll be editing it for the channel. Your funeral. Finals game was incredibly fun. Everyone at the table was fantastic. I loved the energy we had. You'll have to wait for the video to come out, though, because I'm not going to spoil anything for you. The winner of the finals game receives a custom giant meeple to take home, as well as a novelty check. Each of us who participated gets a gift just for making it to the finals, though. Enamel pins. One for Root, one for Ahoy, and two for Oath. As a person who has been entirely consumed by pin trading after attending PAX, I'm delighted. I later traded the Ahoy pin at PAX. The finals are now concluded, and with the hosts announcing our names as we return downstairs, my secret is well and truly out. I Merkel walk my way back to the crowd and quickly find that a small line has formed out of people who are equal parts astonished and mortified to learn I'd been deceiving them for days now. A few people even want my autograph, for purposes other than binding legal agreements, which... I think I'll let all of you in on a little secret. Being able to make someone's day like that, this is the whole reason I make videos in the first place. If I cared about fame, I would have my face in the thumbnails. I'd also brought a bunch of Canadian candy to hand out, 
and I'm glad to see that it has managed to disappear from the rough heap I left it in before the game. The remainder of my evening is spent hanging out with friends, listening to the live podcast episode, which sadly could not be recorded. and trying to figure out how to buy a t-shirt using PayPal. The Woodland War Machine lads announced that it's everyone's last chance for photos before the end of the night, and I opt to get a photo with them in a Power Rangers-esque Sentai team pose, which the cameraman holding my phone captures in portrait mode. Yuris and I. In the dwindling moments of RootCon, I find myself commiserating with Garrick and Lily over the challenges of administrating an online gaming community such as Woodland Warriors. Only by actually taking on the role of admin does one learn just how many no-win scenarios the job will foist upon you. As a result of my own experience, I've always held a certain professional respect for anyone willing to hold such a role to ensure the longevity of their community. It's at this point that I am shocked to uncover a new piece of the Garrick sample's deep lore. Garrick is a hugger, and he'd like to give me a hug before I have to leave. Imagine, I chide, wanting physical contact with me, of all people. Mystifying. I'm not shy about physical contact, however, and I can say with confidence, Garrick and Lily give very good hugs. The doors are closing, and it's time to say my goodbyes. Farewell, RootCon. You were the second best thing to happen to me this year. And now that I'm finally home and sitting down to write this script and reminisce over my journey from food poisoning to finalist, a new thought dawns upon me. I've picked up a sinus infection. Thank you all for watching, and to Woodland War Machine, Good Time Society, and Leader Games for organizing such a fantastic event. It was genuinely incredible, and I would happily return so long as it doesn't bankrupt me. And as always, Subscribe or don't, I'm not your dad.